minutes, uh, the meeting of Thursday, March 25th, 2021. Our meeting will begin with a public hearing on the application of Escalante, the international, uh, for transfer of the annual club, all alcoholic beverages license at 159 Ballville Road, and the transfer of the annual beer and wine retail license at 295 Wilder Road to the International Beverage Service Company. I will read the notice of public hearing. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on Thursday, March 25th, 2021 at 7 p.m. via Zoom on the application uh, of Escalante, the International LLC, 2930 Bledsoe Street, Suite 124, Fort Worth, Texas, 76107. For the transfer of the annual club, all alcoholic beverages license at 159 Baldwin Road, and the transfer of the annual beer and wine retail license at 295 Wilder Road to the International Beverage Service Company, LLC. The application is available for review at the Town Hall, 663 Main Street, Bolton, by appointment only. Please contact Jenny Jacobson to schedule. Uh, it's probably too late to do that. Any person interested or wishing to be heard in this matter should appear at the time and place designated. We will allow public comment, uh, but uh, I think I'm supposed to ask if this was properly posted to the town administrator. Yes, it was, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Escalante, the International LLC, uh, I believe we have uh, Kelly Cardoza to uh, address the board. Kelly is trying to dial in right now because for some reason she can't get in to the Zoom. Yeah. She yeah. is she, in here. Okay. She, she's muted and not on video, but she's there. Yeah. Hey, Kelly, they can see you or know that you're there. We can't hear you very There's well. Somebody. She's very faint. Unmute yeah, very faint. There you are. Okay, how's that? Excellent. Oh, I hear them now. Yeah, I don't hear them. Go to settings. Well, we're here. Uh, let us know when you can hear us through there. And I'll just talk to make sure that when you get your audio, you know. Um, any better now? Hello? Yes. Can you hear us? Hey, can you uh, hear me? I can yes. hear you. Hear you. Kelly, you can call in on a telephone um, to get sound and do it that way. Okay. She can't hear you That's say that. Do this on the phone. Oh. We can hear you. If we, if we leave and come back in, I think. Why? What's the matter? I think when I joined, I picked the wrong choice for, for okay. audio. We're we going to try and just join back in. Please, I'm sorry about this. No problem. Okay. It wouldn't be a selectman's meeting if everything went just fine the whole meeting. <laughs> <laughs> We do have Stephen Brennan, if we want to flip-flop. I know Kelly was going to introduce him. Uh, Mr. Brennan, do you want to, well, let's see. Kelly look, or looks like she's, what about now, okay. Kelly? Can you hear us? You're on mute. You're, You're on still mute. on mute. That's, that's the least of our problems. All right. <laughs> can you hear okay. us now? I can. All right. Well, welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Kelly Derpy Cardoza, um, and I'm here this evening to represent Escalante, the International LLC, and the International Beverage Service Company um, in the transfer of the existing liquor licenses from the International in Twin Springs. Um, yesterday, I provided the board through Jenny with the required affidavit for the public notice and the mailings um, and they were abutters notified uh, in the newspaper as well as in Bolton, Lancaster, and Clinton. Um, I have with me Steve Brennan, who actually got here much more easily than I did today. Um, and Steve will be the general manager of Twin Springs and of um, the International. You 
I'm sure you all know that the international declared bankruptcy um, last year in May and that its assets were purchased out of bankruptcy by Escalante, the international LLC, a Texas facility. Um, the International Beverage Service Company is the operational arm and will lease the facility from Escalante, the international. So there really is no proposed change in the types of licenses or the areas where liquor is served from past practices. So in my office, I had a site plan loaded up on my computer. And I don't know that I can, my intention was to share the screen. Um, Kelly, I can share that if you'd like. That would be great. Oops. I have to see you again and I don't know why there. Okay. So can you go ahead and put that yellow and with the little blue dot site plan on there, Jenny? No, I'm muted, Jenny. Sorry, I covered up my screen. Um, I assume it's the, the LLA meeting plans number one, Escalante, that you want me to share first? It is. It's, it's the yellow color on top of it. That might be yeah. all that we need, actually. Okay, I'll share that now. So um, generally speaking, there's, there's no proposed changes in what has been done in the past. So this is just to show you how liquor has been served. The area in yellow is um, the international, and it is a full season club license for all alcoholic beverages. And liquor is served um, on the entire grounds of the property and the golf holes, but only those that are located in Bolton. So for orientation, I can't really point for you, but on the right-hand side of your plan is Ballville Road, the main entrance to the international um, heads to the um, to the west and the first building that you encounter when you enter the facility is their clubhouse. So in that clubhouse, um, there are formal and executive dining areas, a bar and associated patios where liquor will be served. If you head then to the north on this plan, um, there's the golf house or the fireplace room slash pro shop building. That includes the fireplace room restaurant, a locker room bar, and a private dining slash meeting room where, where alcohol will be served. Um, and there's a bar there in that fireplace room. Uh, again, if we move to the north, the building that has um, kind of three wings to it is the guest lodge uh, or the lodge and conference center. That has a common area with uh, a bar, 54 hotel rooms and conference and meeting rooms and alcohol will be served in those areas out onto the golf course. Um, again, I can't point, so um, thank you. Just right there, there are the two snack bars, um, the Oaks snack bar and the Pine snack bar. They're a little bit lower. Oh, right here and here. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and so alcohol will be served from there. And then there are beverage carts that go across the, the uh, golf course. So that would be all of the lawns, grounds, and the golf holes that are located in Bolton will be served by that beverage cart. And again, you'll notice that there's a kind of a very sharp line on the westerly side of this plan. And that's because uh, the holes that are in Lancaster are not included in the permit application. And that's the way it's always been. The Twin Springs license is a full season general on-premise license for wine and malt beverages. And it, that's limited to the pro shop, which is that small blue building um, across Wilder Road on the north of the plan um, at 295, exactly right there, at 295 Wilder Road. Um, so there is a, um, a, a snack bar interior to that building, and there is patio seating where um, wine and malt beverages will be served. There is no alcohol served on the golf course proper um, at Twin Springs. 
So now I just like to ask Steve to share a bit about who he is and what Escalante envisions for um, their ownership of the property. Thank you all for having us tonight. Appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to introduce myself and present the, uh, the liquor license scenario. Uh, you know, Don, you and I have met briefly via phone and Zoom previously, but for the rest of you, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, and again, thank you for taking the time tonight. Um, a little background on myself. I was actually born in, at Winchester Hospital, grew up in North Andover, uh, did my grade school and middle school there. And then I was out in Arizona for high school and college. And after that, uh, <clears throat> went into the golf industry, uh, multiple states, multiple cities, and uh, ultimately ended up with uh, another one of the premier properties in Massachusetts doing a similar project. Uh, I was down at New Seabury for about 15 years, uh, just as they came out of bankruptcy. And so it's, uh, we're very excited to be back in Massachusetts. Uh, the last three or, four, or a couple of years, uh, my wife and I were in Tennessee. I was building another project there for another company. And we literally saw this opportunity. I reached out to Escalante on a Thursday, on a Friday, we spoke. On Sunday, I flew to Texas. And on Wednesday, we had a deal for me to move back to Massachusetts. So very, uh, very excited to be back and uh, very excited about the opportunity and excited about working with the town. As far as our operational aspect, um, we've been set the international up to go back to the way it was many years ago, being a truly private facility. Uh, it'll be 36 holes, private membership um, that uh, is a golf first experience. We are uh, not allowing public access, if you will, to either of the 18 holes or the dining room and even the function space is gonna be based only on members sponsoring their own events. So uh, changing the, uh, the format dramatically from what it's been the last few years and truly making it that private golf experience again. And that is uh, you know, truly the model that we've set on and we're going forward and it's been extremely well received so far by the uh, former members as well as members that, or people that had not been members previously. So we're off to a good start there. Over the last, uh, as you know, we closed on February 10th. <clears throat> I think I got here February 11th. And since then we've been basically doing a remodel on the interior of the fireside clubhouse, if you will, uh, the golf shop, uh, carpets taken out, all the furniture removed, uh, ceilings taken down. Uh, same with the fireside room going in with new ceilings, new carpet, new paint, new furniture. I believe we're on 12 dumpsters at this point. So uh, moving right along, and we are actually scheduled to do a sock opening in April. So we're quite excited to showcase it to the world. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Brennan. Uh, are there any comments or questions from the Board of Selectmen? Uh, no, no questions. Uh, uh, Steve and, and, uh, uh, and, and everyone from, from Escalante, Thanks very much for coming tonight. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Uh, you know, we know that the, the international meant a lot uh, uh, to the family that had owned it before. And uh, I, I've been involved with the club, not as a member, but as part of the municipal government and, and work very closely uh, with, with the owners and the general, previous general manager. So we look forward to uh, helping you get the club back up and running. So I have no questions, but uh, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Jonathan, anything? No, I have no comments or questions, but welcome. Uh, welcome to Bolton. Welcome. Um, and there, there was a very complimentary article about the uh, international in today's Boston Globe also, sports section. <laughs> um, at this point, I would ask if there is anyone in the public, the general public, have any comments in support of this application. Uh, if you do, please use the raise your hand feature on um, the Zoom. And I'm not seeing anything there. Um, 
Mr. Nishwe is raising his hand. Uh, Ken Nishwe is uh, raising his hand. All right. I, on okay. Screen. Ken, go ahead. Ken, you're muted. Okay. Uh, I, along with Stan, worked with the International for uh, 14 years from the Board of Selectmen and also the planning board uh, many years ago. And the International has always been a, a neighbor of mine. I uh, live on Sawyer Road and um, we almost abut each other. Water Aquatic uh, suburbs, uh, differentiates our property from the former Schultz farm that they have purchased. And they have always been a very good friend and a very good neighbor and a very good addition to the town of Bolton. And I would concur with you folks that I would like to support them any way I could. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Are there any other comments um, in opposition to this application? I would make note that we did receive one email from a Ballville Road resident asking us not to approve this. But are, are, is there anybody in attendance at this meeting who wishes to speak in opposition to this application? Um, I can't see everyone. If anyone's got a better gallery view than me and you see someone waving hands, please do that. But, no, we don't have anyone else, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, at this point, I would take a motion from uh, one member of, uh, wait a minute, I have to, do we close the hearing before we vote? No, you vote and then close the hearing. Okay. Um, is there a motion from the board on uh, the disposition of this application? I would move that the Board of Selectmen support the application of Escalante, the international LLC, uh, to move forward with uh, transferring of the liquor licenses uh, to them. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Roll call. Roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Pekansky. Aye. Thank you. Um, and do, uh, we don't need a vote to close the hearing, do we, Don? We should vote to close the hearing, yes. All right. Do I have a motion to close the hearing? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call. Wysocki? Aye. Keep? Aye. Sikansky? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cardoza, Mr. Brennan. Thank you very much for attending tonight. And we look forward to seeing you and reading good things about you in the coming years. Kelly or Steve, uh, anything you need at any time, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, likewise, please reach out to us and myself. We'd be more than happy to help. Anything. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate that, truly. We do. I was part of the team with Brian Lynch, who did the first golf course, um, or the second golf course, I should say, the Oaks, many years ago. Yep. And, and you as a community have always been very supportive. We thank you for that. Yeah, I remember that. I do. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is a presentation from uh, the engineering film firm Beta Inc. Uh, with uh, our DPW director, Randy Heglin on a potential MassWorks project in, uh, on Main Street. Randy, you wanna start it? Sure, good evening. Thanks for uh, accommodating our, our uh, schedule tonight. And we're gonna do our best to keep you on schedule. So we'll try and uh, keep our presentation uh, short. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom here shortly. He can ex explain uh, what we're doing. Um, this is the second MassWorks application we're submitting. As you know, we had the successful Main Street at Water Aquatic application. That was a su successful project. And we also last year submitted an application for uh, the Forbush Mill Main Street, Green Street up intersection. Um, this, this is what we'd like to discuss again tonight. And I'll turn it over to Tom. Uh, so uh, good evening. I hope uh, you all can hear me. <clears throat> um, uh, I do remember uh, some of uh, you folks, maybe all of you. Uh, we have talked about uh, this location, um, uh, I, I guess it was just about two years, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and that would be um, the intersection at uh, Route 117, uh, Fallfish Mill Road and Green Road um, up near the high school and the DPW garage. 
Um, so as uh, Randy said, um, last year, uh, the town of Bolton um, submitted an application. It was not accepted, um, but uh, through that process, uh, MassWorks did what they call a debriefing, uh, at which uh, Randy and I attended. They gave us some uh, very good feedback as to the competitiveness of the uh, process. Um, I think a lot of the feedback was that it was a good application. Um, they understood uh, what we were trying to achieve. Um, however, um, what has been happening is that even though it's not required of small communities, many small communities have now been doing um, preliminary engineering, which they are looking at as almost a match and certainly um, have elevated the um, status and the progress of their project, which makes them look uh, less of a risk. Uh, and that's what Mass, uh, MassWorks looks for is projects that are gonna move forward and be buildable in the, in the um, time periods that uh, you agree upon. So um, understanding that um, there was um, uh, a discussion to advance this project a little bit more. You had already done counts, you had already done some conceptual uh, drawings inside the right of way. Um, so there was, um, we are advancing it uh, just a little bit more. And um, the end result of that um, uh, design will be that uh, we will be able to bring forward to MassWorks a, an, a, um, an approval of one of these concepts, either a roundabout or an intersection and put to it a, uh, a more accurate price tag um, because we'll know the, um, the type, the solution that you want at that location. So tonight, really, we just wanna um, present that um, April 2nd is an opportunity to file what is called an expression of interest where we would put forward this project and uh, mass work uh, and based on the, the things that have happened um, in the meantime, since we had the debriefing, we would put forward those um, uh, changes. MassWorks would uh, again give us an opinion of yes, this is a strong application or you should do this, you should do that um, type of advice. And then um, for June 2nd, we would then file the actual application with MassWorks, which would be decided upon um, during the summer and awards made in the fall. Um, so really tonight is to kind of kick off the process of um, talking about um, the process of how we make this decision together um, and the community becomes comfortable with uh, selecting one of these choices. Um, I have the two um, concepts again if you'd like to uh, quickly look at them. Um, Jan I believe can uh, post them if, if that's what you'd like to do or if you'd like to ask some questions more about the process or any of the, any of the particulars, I'd be available to do that too. Um, certainly we'd like to go over the alternatives again. I would like to make a couple of comments. Uh, first off, um, this will be the first opportunity for many residents of Bolton to see these um, proposals. And what I, would, what I would propose to do is that the town uh, after tonight's meeting, there'll be public documents and that we post them for people to download and examine. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, you two back on for our meeting on April 15th, if, if the other board members concur, to uh, at that specifically for the purpose of collecting public comment. Um, so there wouldn't necessarily be anything new from you needed, but it would give the, the public an opportunity to ask questions about two, the two proposals and to rent, offer their opinions. Uh, is, how does that sound to the other board members? That's fine with me. Sounds great. The, the other comment I have is, as I look at these two proposals and uh, it seems that the roundabout would solve some problems better than the, um, the four-way uh, stoplights on the other hand, the four-way stoplights would solve some problems better than the roundabout. And I don't think the selectmen have really set priorities among the different things that are affected by this. Are we just trying to slow traffic? Are we just trying, are we looking particularly to make high school crossing safe? Are there other uh, items that we should be uh, taking into account? But in terms of trade-offs, uh, I would hope that before we get to the June 2nd uh, submission, that we've got some idea of what the trade-offs are between these two proposals and how, 
Right. But I, I think uh, the selectmen should be prepared at, at the April 15th meeting to help set some priorities so that we can evaluate these two proposals uh, between April 15th and June 2nd, or whenever the submission actually occurs. That's fine. I did you have did, a question? Um, uh, didn't Mr. Laughlin say they, they were going to submit on uh, April 2nd? Is that right, Mr. Laughlin? Uh, so on April 2nd, um, an expression of interest is a new um, procedure within MassWorks. What they found is that they've been receiving a lot of uh, applications that are kind of missing information or different um, um, unexplained issues that they can't, they can't rank well. And they would rather that people submit kind of a preliminary application so they can help them uh, understand the program better and, and target uh, exactly what their, um, you know, what funding program best fits them. Um, this is not only, this is for housing, this is for uh, infrastructure, it's, it, it has a whole list of uh, things. It's, it's under a program now called One Stop um, and is a website that offers a ton of information about it. Um, so, but so, uh, so the, the expression of interest is just, uh, it's a thousand word type of um, submission of this is the project we are considering. Um, this, you know, this is the um, the reason why uh, we uh, we need assistance. Uh, you know, it's a safety issue. It's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the whatever the things might be. Uh, there's no submission of any graphics. There's no submission of any any type of documents um, that would occur um, on June second um, that we would okay. make this type of application. So, so our schedule will work with yours. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I, I, uh, the earlier the better. Obviously, these are not. Um, you know, easy decisions, um, and they do take time to uh, to hear from uh, many people, um, and many people have great ideas because they they travel this road certainly more than I do, and they're going to understand it. Um, you know, uh, in the in the way they travel it, and we want to hear from all of those uh, folks about it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, why don't we look at the two proposals now? Okay. So Jenny, uh, you can show either one. It doesn't matter. Whatever. However, what order you have them in. Okay. Um... So there is also the one-stop slides document. You, you're talking about the roundabouts and the signal. The, the actual area, uh, right? graphics, yeah. If the board yeah. wants to see the uh, other one-stop and has some time, we can go over that. But uh, otherwise, okay. I can just leave that as a submission for them. So I'll start with the roundabout because it's the first mm -hmm. in my list. OK. So uh, in both cases, uh, what we've seen before the graphic comes up, but what we've heard is uh, you know uh, these both of these intersections have uh, very fast moving traffic. Um, there's a you know increase in traffic obviously with the school. Um, there seems to be um, a desire for many of the um, kids that go to the school to come across the street over to the uh, pizza place, and uh, it, crossing the road um, is not uh, very convenient at all. Um, so a desire, one of the desires uh, would be to, uh, to, to slow down traffic. And I think that's a desire not only here, but along other stretches of 117. Um, and uh, in this configuration, we're showing what would be considered a modern roundabout. Um, the red dotted lines on the outside are an approximate uh, layout of your um, uh, roadway width and uh, layout. Um, you'd see in the bottom um, left are, uh, is, you know, the DPW garage to kind of orient yourself in the high school parking lot, you can obviously see as well. Um, roundabouts are made um, to essentially um, what they call deflect uh, vehicles as they come into the roundabout, requiring them to slow down and not to pass over um, those uh, two inner circles. There is, a, there is an inner circle in the middle that is raised. Um, and then there is another circle that is sloped uh, that is around that one where it's, um, we'll call it uncomfortable to drive over. It would be a kind of a rumbled uh, texture, um, but it is uh, available for a larger truck uh, to be able to drive over it so that they can make their move and get to the school for deliveries or other, other travel that they would have. Um, these have become more common. I believe there's a few of them in your area now. Um, I think it's important that you do go try to experience these as a driver and as a pedestrian. Um, and if any of you are bicyclists, uh, also to try to experience it that way as well. 
Um, the, there is a new one in um, Hudson. Uh, it's, of course, would operate differently than this. Hudson, you know, the uh, density of businesses around it and the parking that surrounds it and things like that are gonna, it's gonna react uh, differently. The drivers will react differently. Um, could, it might be easier for de pedestrians to cross at the one there um, because of the, uh, um, the, the shorter distance across the street. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the choice between a roundabout and a signal, um, we have done some preliminary analysis. Um, they both provide about the same, what we'll call level of service or the amount of delay that you would expect along 117. They both generally have about the same, um, diff uh, same length of queuing that might occur um, during the uh, school arrivals uh, and departures. Um, and so it really is uh, going to be more of an operational perspective and um, uh, I'll call it some personal opinion or um, uh, a comfort level in, in what you uh, prefer um, as either a pedestrian, a driver, a bicyclist, um, you know, coming through um, the location. Um, so this one, I, I will assume, will probably be the one that you might want to understand more um, because I think you probably all understand signals a little bit more in the sense that you've probably experienced them more in all three of those um, uh, user roles. Um, but uh, here, as was suggested on the April 15th, we will bring with us the um, advantages and disadvantages of roundabouts in general, and then also be able to address that specifically here and how those things get addressed. Um, but essentially roundabouts are used as a way to slow vehicles down. Um, the, uh, the folks who uh, are proponents of uh, roundabouts believe that it is safer for pedestrians to cross at these lo locations because the cars are forced to slow down and it allows the uh, driver and the um, um, pedestrian to kind of make that eye contact that's necessary that they, you know, they both understand um, you know, what the desire is to come across the street. Um, signalized intersections, other fe people feel a lot safer by pressing uh, a button, getting the traffic to stop, having that protected time to cross the street um, and, and come across. Um, that, I don't know if that's um, based on any, you know, age or um, just our own experiences, um, but those are, those are some of the differences uh, for the pedestrian um, that, uh, you know, people uh, see uh, between these two. Um, I don't know if, um, Jen, we could look at the signal. Uh, and I don't mean to rush through this, but I know that you've got a, a tight agenda here tonight. So the signal is not going to be uh, a whole lot different um, than, you know, what you've uh, seen, it's um, maybe the, the line work um, we can work on for our presentation. And by, by the time, by April 15th, we will have uh, actual survey for the location and be able to enhance our plan differently to, uh, to kind of bring up these uh, edge of pavements and uh, stop lines and things like that. Um, but essentially it, it's a, you know, there are four approaches. Um, we'd have stop line at all of them. We're, we're proposing that there be two crossings, one across uh, Forbush Mill Road, the other one that would go across um, 117. Um, those types of things, you know, being a preliminary plan where we are, those types of things can vary. Um, we had intended, you'll see on the lower part of the screen, we had intended to connect to a pathway that was installed um, some time ago, I'm not sure when, um, but at the same time, we're aware that um, that parcel of land uh, may be uh, under consideration for some um, development. And, um, you know, we would uh, try to include uh, that into the signal design so that, um, you know, if, it, if a development doesn't happen there now, it certainly uh, would seem to be a desirable place uh, for something to happen, you know, at a future date. Um, I... What we plan to do is we plan to have discussions with the school to understand um, uh, their needs. Um, we plan to have discussions with uh, police and fire um, and to understand those needs. Uh, the public input on the 15th um, would be very useful, um, especially if we have regular 
uh, well, let's say even different drivers, people who drive it during the commute, people who drive it in the afternoon, weekends, you know, all the different uh, operations that we'd want to hear about. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you know, I can, I can stop and uh, we can certainly get into a lot more detail on the 15th. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so looking at the right of way and the red line, I'm just wondering, is there a way um, to get Forbush Road and Green Road to align a little bit more? Uh, certainly, uh, they, we could do that from an engineering perspective, but um, in order to do that, it would probably require some type of right of way transfers or just stuff that would uh, possibly knock you out of the box in terms of a MassWorks grant. Um, mm -hmm. MassWorks uh, looks for the low risk, um, kind of shovel ready, uh, as shovel ready as possible type project. So they have a checklist of things um, that they, um, they do not want you to have to deal with. Um, uh, environmental permitting, uh, right of way, uh, utility relocations are tops on the list. Um, so if you had a right of way issue, um, they have been known to um, postpone an approval until you get that right of way issue resolved and then to come back to them with the project. Um, so that's certainly an option, um, you know, to go in at a future year as well. Um, but that would be the downside of trying to uh, realign that now. So um, you, would, you wouldn't be able to move um, Forbush Road a little bit more into the DPW site? Put it, put it on a, a bit of a skew and, uh, and, uh, and align them possibly better. Yeah, I, we could certainly look at that from a signalized perspective. Uh, from the roundabout perspective, we probably need that sharper angle to come into the side. But from, a, from an intersection signalized one, Let's see how much we can move it um, and still stay within the right of way. Because even, even the DPW parcel, uh, there's a difference between the road layout and a town owned parcel. So we would yeah. want to stay within the road layout to make mm -hmm. sure that we're not um, stepping outside of, uh, of the um, guidelines that MassWorks has set. But we can, we can look at, at that, how much we can align and, and does it uh, have an effect on it. Okay, thank you. But one thing that I think of looking at this picture, and I know it's very far off, but you know the high school is looking at a building project. And as I understand it, the main delivery entrance, as well as the school bus entrance, is that big driveway on the right side of the picture off of Green Road. Okay. And if you're gonna be in conversations with the school, um, I hope you ask them how I'd hate to see either of these projects push more of those delivery trucks onto Green Road. Well, that is part of our discussion with them is, is first to understand how they operate now. Um, maybe a question of how they'd like to operate if they could change, you know, if they were king for a day in a sense. And sometimes out of that comes a, you know, a response that, uh, you know, heck, we didn't think of that, but they might because they, they operate this thing on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, and, and then, you know, what are, what, what are there? I'm, I'm glad you told me if they have future plans, maybe they have, they've thought about this from a site perspective and they have some different ideas about how they'd like to do that. And maybe now is the time to engage them in that discussion so that the signal design or the, let's call it intersection design could match better with the way they operate the site. Okay. I'm on the building committee for the high school. It just got off the ground. If somebody has designs on changing that, it's a very well kept secret at this point. <laughs> okay. I hope okay. you can, you know, I hope. Well, that, I, I, I guess that. we're at the, we're at the best point then, right? To start yeah. that conversation. Yeah. Okay. They wouldn't keep secrets from you anyway, I don't think, would they? <laughs> no, no. It, it, we're we're just one. It's just one big open book to everybody else. That's what I thought. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> or we could put a bridge over the road. I don't know. Um, any other you, questions? 
Are there any if, if, if you have a moment, I'm not sure if you do, I can explain to you the one stop and uh, the fact that it encompasses more than just mass works. Let, um, let me ask if there's any public questions with the uh, uh, proviso that everyone understand there's going to be another opportunity for detailed ones. But if someone has any high, le high level questions from the general public, uh, please uh, raise your hand or make yourself known. I don't see anything. Um, why don't you go ahead and walk us through one stop? Uh, sure, um, Jenny, if you can uh, put those up while I'm talking. Uh, so one stop is a is a new program. Um, Ten years ago, MassWorks was developed, um, and it was the combination of eight uh, different funding programs, where the state felt that um, certain larger communities who had grant writers and plan uh, mature planning agencies uh, were gobbling up all the uh, funding because they were kind of reaching out and applying at all the different places at once. So they decided that we're gonna have one application for these eight programs and we're gonna try to put the money into the right places and benefit more folks. Um, program has been extremely successful across the state, has helped so many communities build things and get things done. and. Uh, develop the governor's initiatives of more housing, um, you know, in in, um, in critical need across the state. Um, so now they've uh, taken the program, combined it with, I believe, eight additional um, funding programs, and they have now calling it One Stop. And these are uh, some of the agencies, some of the um, departments under the secretary's uh, um, Rain that um, you know fall into this. So Mass Works, uh, some of them you'll recognize, some of them maybe not. I think you recognize Housing Choice. I think Bolton benefited from a Housing Choice grant um, two years ago, maybe. Um, there's some new ones here. Community Planning of Grants is a rural development fund that uh, you would be you would qualify for. Could be used to upgrade water lines and other different types of infrastructure. Um, there's underutilized properties and site readiness grants as well. Um, I don't think you have any brownfields uh, in Bolton. Um, um, Jenny, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and here's a, on the next slide is kind of a listing of um, the different types of things um, that they would consider under these programs. So on the far right, uh, infrastructure horizontal, they would pay for design, engineering, permitting, build, uh, bidding, construction, you know, they would do capital improvements to a building. They would do site preparation. Um, I know that down down towards 495, I think it's Bolton, I forget the name of the, there's a small commercial development down there. If there were ideas to uh, change, maybe change that or to other developments, maybe the one near um, the intersection that we're talking about tonight, um, there could be um, money available where the town could kind of think through the process, you know, um, uh, another idea is that, you know, 117 itself, um, you know, uh, as I said, needs, it needs help in uh, kind of slowing down traffic, maybe better organizing traffic, adding some safety features, more sidewalks, uh, biking along the, along the route, um, maybe uh, developing a more of a master plan for the corridor, um, rather than kind of uh, going after each of these projects one at a time that type of master plan would allow you to work with developers. When they came into the community, you could say, this looks like a great idea. We'd like you to fit it into our master plan, which might include extending a section of sidewalk or adding um, you know, a multi-use path or um, different other things that um, the corridor, you know, as um, you know, officials, you might want to include in a plan that you could go back to and say, this is what we had in mind. This is what we want Bolton to be. Um, and then as these opportunities come along, continue to plug in the pieces and, and build that idea over some time. So um, they're good programs. Uh, there's no penalty to apply, especially in this um, expression of interest period. And they would give you very good feedback on, you know, we think this is a great project. Here are the three things you should do before you apply. Um, and it kind of gives you that checklist of, okay, let's do these things and we'll apply next year. Or we've already got those done. Let's, let's go for something this year. Um, as a small community, you are eligible for $1 million every year through MassWorks. You're eligible for up to $100,000 through Housing Choice uh, each year. 
um, because you, I believe you are still a housing choice community. Um, it's, it's based on uh, the percentage of uh, new housing that you brought on in town. Um, so you are, you qualify well for many of these programs. Um, and it's a matter of, um, you know, uh, exploring it, right? There's no, no commitment. It's just, you know, kind of get your expression in there and tell them, tell them what you're dealing with, what you're thinking about, and they will help to guide you, um, with what, what could be possible. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Mr. Laughlin, Brandy, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we'll see you on the 15th. <coughs> uh, next up is an uh, update from Wood Partners on uh, the friendly 40B at 580 Main Street. I believe Mr. Jim Lambert's with us and will be speaking to this. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and uh, folks out there in the public who are on. Uh, pleased to be here again. Thank you for having us. Um, yes, we will. Uh, we are very happy and excited to run you through an update uh, of the project that we are proposing. I've got a couple of members of our team here with me tonight. Uh, most specifically, Mike Tulipani, our design manager, who is going to jump in uh, and help me out uh, at walking through the site plan. And I see uh, Jeff O'Neill from Condine, the site owner, just jumped on as well. Uh, if Jeff wants to add anything. Um, could somebody allow me to share my screen or if that maybe that's already in play here? It looks like it might be. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, we'll get started. Um, so we're here to talk about 580 Main Street, uh, which is the, the back portion of the Bolton Office Park as it exists today. Uh, we're calling the project Alta Neshoba Valley, uh, at least for the time being. And it's a name that we actually think we really like and, and very well may stick. Tonight, we're gonna walk you through uh, a little bit of an overview of Wood Partners, although I know we did that last time, so I'll keep that brief. We're gonna obviously walk through the project, including uh, and specifically the update since we last um, spoke with you all. And then we're going to go through a couple of the, the benefits and impacts um, high level at this point, um, very early on that, you know, that we foresee being uh, involved in the project subject to further study, of course. And then we want to talk a little bit about the next steps uh, in the process and how we can move this project forward together, hopefully. Um, we do have a couple of slides at the end for comparable projects and as well as case studies of some properties that we've built across the state. I went through these last time. So um, depending on how much time we have and if anybody's interested, I can run through those quickly or not. All right, quickly about Wood Partners. So we're a, uh, we're a national apartment developer. We're based down in Atlanta. We've been around since 1997. We now have 20 offices around the country, including here in Massachusetts. Um, I am the managing director of that office. We're out of Lexington. We've been operating in Massachusetts for well over a decade. Um, down below is a list of the projects that we have developed or are currently developing across the state, including several up and down 495. Um, we're under construction as we speak in Wayland, which just started a couple of weeks ago, which we're very excited about. On 218 units, right on Route 20. And we've been in construction for a while now on a large project in Somerville, which is 329 units. Um, and just going back to what a little bit high level, you know, we are um, one of the largest and most capable developers in the country um, where we have a national footprint, a national a backbone, but we're very local in terms of uh, what we do in each market. It's all very different, um, but financially in terms of um, accounting and processes and procedures, that all comes from the top and it's really a great mix and, and it allows us to execute at a high level. Um, we've been very successful here locally. We are not only a developer, I think this is an important point. We're not only the developer, but we're also the general contractor in the property management company as well. So you won't just see us at the very beginning and then spinning off. You'll see us all the way through um, from, from now uh, through shovels in the ground, through the lease up in, in operations. So we think that's a really a value add. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Yes, please, of course. Um, 
the, the list you have here, some of those are in process, but over the past 10 or 15 years, um, roughly how many properties have you built and how many do you still manage? So the top, uh, we, we still currently have the, the top four that you see there um, are, are still ours. And then one down in Cambridge, which about halfway through is still ours. Um, the others, some of them have either been sold or have been taken over by our equity partner. So it's a mix. And we expect that to be the same going forward as well. It's, it's ever changing. A lot of it depends on who is our equity partner. We, we partner with some of the biggest firms in the country. Um, projects cost, uh, you know, a significant amount of money and uh, takes um, high level investors to get them done. So it, it all depends on sort of where we are in the market, who our partner is and all sorts of things. But we would, our preference would be always to continue to manage the property um, as long as we could. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it does not. So of, of all the properties that you've completed in Massachusetts and elsewhere, yep. what percentage of them do you still manage? Um, I, about four, I would look at looking at the list. Uh, we've got 460 or so um, out of the 3,000, I guess, or 2,900, because you got to take out the ones that are the 3,300. Um, but some of these go back 12, you know, 10, 12 years as well. So, so it's, I mean, did I hear that about 25% of them you still manage? Uh, it would be a little, I guess it would be about a little bit below that. So let's call it, uh, 460 out of 2,900. I'd have to, I'd have to do that math. <laughs> It's, it's more like 16%, I guess, Okay. Um, today. And again, that's that's ever changing. You know, we'll be managing Wayland and Somerville when they come online. Yep. So that number okay. will boost up pretty significantly. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, I'll move on from here. Uh, just a map view of where we've developed across the state. Uh, as you can see, primarily outside of the city of, of Boston proper, where uh, we've been largely focused on the suburbs, um, some closer in, but the vast majority along 128 or even further west, including up in Andover, Franklin, um, Framingham, Walpole, uh, places you know further out west um, than the city. Okay, I'm gonna jump into the project overview. We'll get to the site plan in a minute, but I just wanna kind of reset everything for you. So. It's a, just under a 32 acre property um, that would be with the Alta Neshoba Valley. It's located as we've noted at 580 Main Street in the rear of the existing office building park. Approximately, th this gets into some of the changes that we'll show you in the plan later. Only about approximately 13 of the 32 acres um, will be developed. Um, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, the wetlands area and the well area have eaten up uh, a large chunk of the site, and I think for better or worse, um, and it's got, I think it's got some pros and cons to it as well. Um, the office building is currently 110,000 square feet, about 25% at least in total. Approximately half of that building will come down to make way for this apartment development. So there's basically there's sort of two pods uh, to the office park right now. One of those pods will stay um, and continue to be operated by, as an office building and one would go away. And you'll be able to see sort of an outline of that in a minute. Um, we are proposing 233 apartment homes uh, located in three New England style residential buildings, as well as a few townhomes, each with a courtyard and then a standalone amenity building. Again, as we'll go through in a minute, this is a pretty significant change uh, from what we showed you last time, it's down from 276. So it's a, uh, a 43 unit reduction from what we last showed you a few months back. And we'll get into the reasons why that is in a few minutes. All the buildings, I think this is important. All the buildings will be three stories or less. Um, as you'll see, the, the residential buildings are three stories um, and the amenity building is one story. It'll be a propped up um, roof, but a, but a one story building as you enter the site. This is both for a couple of reasons. One, it's we, we feel, we've heard and we feel 
that it's the most appropriate for the town of Bolton. Um, many of these types of developments are four stories or higher. Uh, we feel like in the context of the town, a three-story approach is, is most appropriate, as well as in discussions with the uh, Bolton Fire Department, um, you know, we understand that resources are, are limited, both in equipment and staffing. And we understand that going to a four-story approach um, would require some changes, likely to both of those things, both to equipment and the staffing. And so we're, we're staying away from that. Um, and um, we think that is the, the right approach here, but we're certainly open to uh, comments on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, under the 40B program, 25% of the units will be designated as affordable housing. This is important for folks earning up to 80% of the area median income. All 233 units, however, will count towards the uh, Town of Bolton's SHI, subsidized housing inventory, which uh, would get you over your 10% um, requirement, presumably for some uh, extended period of time. Uh, and then just a note on the property. So our properties are, are class A, high end. They'll feature full amenity packages, uh, state-of-the-art fitness center, resident lounge, business work from home stations, which are more important than ever, three courtyards, and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one with a pool, outdoor fireplace, dining areas, and grill, which again are, are just growing in importance um, given the pandemic and lifestyle choices. The property will consist of a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units um, mixed throughout the building. So currently the concept plan is calling for 100 one bedroom units at an average of 803 square feet, uh, 105 two bedroom units at an average of 1,088 square feet, 24 three bedroom flats at an average of 1,350 square feet. And then we've added four townhomes um, that could be two bedrooms or three bedrooms. We're showing them as three bedrooms now at an average of 2,505 square feet. There will be 325 parking space, surface parking spaces, excuse me. And then th we were able to fit 32 private garages. Uh, can never have enough of those. And so that's a total of 357 spaces, <coughs> a ratio of 1.53, um, which hits the mark of where we want to be uh, in a development in a town like Bolton. And then everything I just said is really summarized below in a, in a chart there for you by percentage and number of units and bedrooms. And we can certainly flip back to this afterward if folks want to see it again or have questions. Okay, here's, a, I think everybody probably is familiar with the site, but in case you're not, here's an aerial of the site um, with a dotted line outline roughly of the, the component that would be involved in the uh, apartment development. As you can see, the two pot office building, as I mentioned, being split off to one with the entrance remaining and likely some parking being reconfigured um, uh, than it is today, differently than it is today. Okay, as a reminder, here's the previous concept that we showed uh, to this board a couple of months ago. So when you, we came down the entry drive, there was a standalone amenity building, uh, which actually remains, which you'll see in the next plan. And then we had eight uh, three-story buildings, seven of which were 36 units each. And the eighth one was 24 units, all with surface parking. And I can't see the number. I think it was 12, a very, very limited amount of um, private garage spaces that we could fit on the site. As you're gonna see in a second here, Pretty drastic change because of some factors I'll go through. So here's where we're at today. Um, coming down the entry drive on the right hand side, you'll see um, four townhomes that are connected sort of in two pods. Again, a standalone amenity building that uh, has taken a slightly different shape, but that will probably uh, evolve a few times. Um, and now we've got four buildings two of which look uh, more like what they did before with a 36 unit building in number three, and then a slightly larger 48 unit building for building four. But the biggest difference here is buildings one and two. Um, these are now U-shaped buildings, um, but again, both three stories still with courtyards in the middle, which is somewhere you'll see um, uh, fitted out with uh, the grills, um, seating, 
and that type of thing. But what you'll notice uh, at the bottom of the screen where you see the big circle is that is where the well, the, the zone one for the well radius uh, has come out from our testing. Uh, we've gone through a significant amount of testing on the site from geotechnical, environmental, uh, for, for the wells, for water uh, volume um, and environmental protection, wetlands flagging, so on and so forth. And there were really two components that really squeezed down the developable area of the site. One is the zone one radius of the well, which you can see uh, below. Um, and also the other one was where the wetlands were flagged, which were um, pretty significantly closer into the, uh, to the development than they were previously, or at least what we thought they were previously. <laughs> so what that, what that allowed us to do, or that, what that um, gave us the opportunity to do is sort of change up uh, the building types, uh, buildings one and two are, no, I'll call them larger buildings, but they won't, they won't necessarily look like larger buildings from, you know, from uh, Main Street or from the entry drive because they're the same height. Um, but they do, they do, are, they are combined and condensed a little bit more so that we were able to save um, some of the density, but uh, obviously losing 43 units was pretty significant. We've rearranged the parking to stay out of the wetlands and the zone one area for the wells. Um, but what we were able to do is get a lot more garage parking spaces, which we're happy with and we think will be a huge success and, and highly popular to the residents. Um, as you can see, there's one to the, um, to the bottom of the screen of uh, building two, and then there's two uh, garages between building three and building one. And again, we've circulated the site with parking. We've tried to spread it out as evenly as we possibly can so that everybody doesn't have, to, nobody has to walk. A significant distance uh, from their car to the prop to their building, um, which is always a goal of ours. Um, but I, but I also want to point out is, at, you know, to the top left of the screen where you see the two circle areas, which are existing wells that I, I think are uh, being rebuilt. At one point, we had showed a, a plan where those, uh, where we would put a new well in that area, which would go off of our site and onto town owned land which would have required an easement um, from the town and my understanding that would have had to go on to town meeting. Um, with this reconfigure, re reconfiguration of the site, we were able to avoid that. Um, and we think that's probably best for everybody and best for the process. Um, so we've kept everything on, uh, on the land that we'll be purchasing. Um, and um, that is no longer a part of the equation. Here's some really early rough renderings uh, of what we're thinking. Um, um, you know, th they're going to undergo a lot of evolution and a lot of changes based on feedback we get from you all and other boards in the town, as well as our own input. But this is a, a starting point, you know, pretty, pretty standard at this point. Um, three bedroom pitch roof. Um, I don't know, Mike Tulipani, if you want to sort of add anything to the, the concept here, feel free. Um, but I just want to be clear that these are very early on and subject to being changed quite a bit as we go through the process. Sure. Uh, this is Mike. I apologize. My video camera is not working right now. But um, the, the top left image is a view of the entry drive where you can see the amenity building that was in yellow and the site plan with the chimney on it there. Um, and then beyond that with the blue base is building number one one of the larger buildings, but again, it's three stories with a pitched roof. And, you know, we are providing balconies on a little over 50% of all the units to help break up the facade and give the residents the experience to the outside without actually going out into the courtyard area. Um, view two to the right of that is between building one and four. Building four is the lowest one on the site plan, closest to the wetlands. There's 50 feet in between each building. So we're gonna provide nice landscaping pathways to connect the buildings and to connect the courtyards, et cetera. Um, and the bottom building is a view of the backside of building four. And that parking lot you see is the one that's closest to the wetlands on the bottom of the previous page. Uh, we're looking at fiber cement siding. Um, the colors here are just representative of, you know, something it could be, but as Jim said, we are going to be developing these in a lot more detail going forward. Uh, as we commence the design process further. Thanks, Mike. And again, we can flip back to both the renderings and the site plan in a minute. I just want to make sure I'm um, respectful of the time for the board and get through the presentation. 
Okay, utilities. This is a pretty similar slide to what I showed last time, but just want to run through it again. So um, because uh, the town of Bolton does not offer public water and sewer at this location or gas, um, the development will require, require the construction and operation of an on-site wastewater treatment facility, uh, which we've shortened to WWTF, for sewage disposal and then wells for domestic water and fire suppression services. Um, for, since our last presentation, we've completed our due diligence on the viability of the wastewater treatment facility and the wells, as I previously said. Um, the wells require a larger zone one radius than expected, um, which is reflected in our new concept plan. However, there is no longer going to be an easement requested from the town. Um, as I said, gas is not available at the site either. So heating and cooling and cooking will be electric at the site. Um, we're going to install high efficiency heat pumps and on-demand hot water systems. So the approach of all electric is, is new um, for class A market rate housing in, in uh, greater Boston area. It's been done on some uh, subsidized affordable housing projects and we've done it um, plenty in other parts of the country where the weather is more mild. However, the technology has advanced to a point where we're comfortable um, utilizing it here uh, for this development um, certainly a more green approach um, and something that we're really excited to understand further and implement. And then along with that, something that's currently not be, being shown on, on the run rates of the plan, but we're going to explore the use of rooftop solar as well to feed um, the electrical usage coming out of um, the all electric approach. So uh, I wanted to run through some community benefits as we see them. Certainly this is not an exhausted list and uh, will change, um, but uh, I think it is important to go through what you know, the town gets out of all this. The project will generate significant new tax revenue, um, upwards of $700,000 annually or more. Um, that is our, our you know, initial proposal subject to further study and um, obviously a, an outcome of um, the number of units, the, the income that comes out of the property and so on and so forth, the tax rate. Um, but that's just to give an idea. It's a, it's a large chunk of money uh, that would be available to the town, um, obviously in perpetuity. Uh, provide a high quality class A rental housing, a housing option that is currently lacking in the town and in Massachusetts in general. I think everybody knows and can agree we have a housing shortage, um, including much needed affordable housing housing for younger couples and families who are saving to buy a home, you know, who, who, who may be from Bolton or the surrounding areas or want to get into Bolton um, and purchase a home eventually, but they may not uh, quite yet have the money to do so, or there may not be any housing stock available to them so they could live uh, in a development like ours for a year or two and then save their money and move into a, a new home um, in Bolton or the surrounding communities. And then the opposite, the ability to move down, uh, which we've seen um, be vitally important. Folks who are ready to sell their homes, uh, put some money in their pocket and wanna stay in their own community, not two towns over, but in their own community. Um, that will be available to them as well. Uh, the addition of residents with disposable income that will benefit local businesses. So obviously there's a host of great local businesses in Bolton um, and with a population of folks who will be living in these units, they'll be able to frequent those businesses um, and spend their money there, which will help uh, obviously the, the entrepreneurs uh, in the town of Bolton and surrounding areas as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this will allow the town to claim safe harbor of 10% of 10% affordable housing for the foreseeable future in a location that is minimally impactful to the majority of the town. So obviously there's, there's impacts that come out of development, no matter which way you slice it. Um, you know, the, the town of Bolton undertook uh, a study on housing. And I think um, this site in, in this area in general was identified as a, as a location in town that makes sense for this type of housing. We completely agree with the access to 495 and um, the fact that you're gonna get to and from this property before getting into the bulk of the town, which will, will be one of the least disrupt disruptive uh, locations that you could find in the town of Bolton in, um, in our opinion. And then creation of over 200 new construction jobs. And then there also will be permanent jobs as well for the folks that are there managing the property um, day to day, which again, can only help the local businesses. 
Okay, something that I know everybody wants to talk about, school kids. So, you know, we have not undertaken a, uh, a study of this specifically for our property yet. It's just too early for that until we land on something more specific and we can get into that down the road. But we thought it'd be useful to show uh, an example of a, of a somewhat like kind development in the area I'm sure you all are familiar with or, or, or could easily find. Um, it's in Boxborough called Paddock Estates. Um, we showed it on our previous presentation as a uh, comparable development. It's got 244 units, so more units than we're proposing here. Uh, the information that we obtained from public sources show that it had 38 total school children, 25 of those uh, being in PK through grade four, seven in grades five through eight, and only six at the high school. The unit mix there is 131 one beds, 107 two beds, and six three beds. So, you know, there's no there's no perfect uh, comparison. We looked at a couple of different towns and try to get the information that we could with fair housing and things like that. You you know you gotta um, get the information where you can in public publicly available sources. Um, this is good information, and uh, you know I don't know how that reads to folks, but um, you know. I think there's always less than people think um, that live in you know, these types of developments. And again, a lot of times what you'll see is, and I think the story can be told here by looking at you know, the grades PK through four and then how it drops off significantly is that you'll have young families living in this type of housing with you know, a baby or a toddler or somebody um, or school age ch child and they're saving for a home and eventually they move out and find a home and um, you'll see the drop off you know, how significant that is from um, the early grades to, to high school. Traffic. So again, like, like schools, we haven't um, undertaken a specific traffic study. We contacted our traffic engineer who we plan to use here and just try to get some industry standard numbers um, for you all for this development. And we can, and I've sent this uh, into Jenny. And so it's probably best to be looked at sort of offline um, but I just wanted to show an example of sort of the, the average, you know, generated trips from a, from a multifamily development like ours, um, until we really get into it, um, and study the, you know, study the project specifically with the number of units and the locations and the trips, um, this can only tell you so much, uh, but it does give you a, a pretty decent idea, um, plus or minus of what we might be looking at for, for number of trips, um, post development, post the office, um, being reduced in size. And then just a quick note on the end, this slide already has a, a left turn lane for entering vehicles, which is, I think, uh, a huge help and it's something that we don't have to change. And then exclusive left and right turn lanes for the driveway approach. And then, um, and that, which maximizes the capacity of the unsignalized intersection. Um, the initial feedback was we probably wouldn't require a, a signalized uh, light here, but, but that's something obviously that will be studied in more detail down the road um, during the ZBA process if we are uh, fortunate to get that far. Okay, and the next steps. Um, so what partners would like to pursue a development of this project through the state's local initiative program, also uh, known as a LIP? which is implemented by DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, as there is not zoning in place currently here that allows for the development, um, or at least in the form that we're proposing it in, um, we would propose to take this through a 40B process, a, a friendly 40B, if you will. Um, what that would require is uh, obviously what we've been doing so far and what we continue, plan to continue to do is working closely with you all at the town of Bolton and coming up with a plan um, that we both can get behind. And the first step is putting in an application to the state for project eligibility. So it, it's, it requires basically what you see below. So it's, it's um, not a ton of information. It's information about us, the developer, and our, our interest in the property, a description of the site, uh, current site conditions, which we have now, a site plan, which we have now, but would be developed a little bit further. Sample floor plans and proposed units, which we have from our vast history of developing. A financial pro forma, which we have, and then appraisal of the site, which wouldn't happen until we submit the application to the state. 
Um, the, the LIP staff will review the application. They'll conduct a site visit with um, some representatives of the town, the state, and, and ourselves as the developer. And if they approve it, then they'll issue a site eligibility letter. And once you have that letter in hand, then we can um, turn around and make the application for a comprehensive permit to the Town of Bolton Zoning Board of Appeals and work through that process. So I think what we wanted to, we wanted to lay this out and we wanted to request or ask what, what the thought may be about the steps to get to a joint application to the state. Um, like I said, it's not a super detailed process, but we want to make sure, obviously, and I'm sure you want to make sure um, if this is something that you intend to pursue with us, um, that you're, you're happy with what you're signing. Um, that is not the end of the road. It's only the beginning of the road, certainly, but obviously um, you want to spend time, more time than we have tonight, um, vetting this and coming up with a plan that you all will, will sign your name to. So that's, that's what we're trying to understand and get to ultimately is um, who do we need to meet with? Um, and when, so that we can get to an application, which again, is just the first step in the process um, of many steps and many opportunities for public comment along the way. Do you have a time frame for this um, application, a desired time frame? So, yeah, so, so we, we, we know from past experience um, that putting the application together itself only takes a couple of weeks from where we are today. The majority of uh, the work is done, um, you know, which is basically a lot of civil uh, due diligence on the site and then architectural work, which we do have to take to another level with elevations and things like that. Um, and then physically putting together the application. So we could be ready on our side with our team in a couple of weeks. I think it's more a matter of um, what what the board would like to see in terms of um, meetings and um, <clears throat> um, information from us, you know, to get to the point where where the board of selectmen could sign that application. So, I I, I really would say it can be done as fast um, as as everyone would like or or not. Um, obviously, the risk of you know the process playing out slower is that another project could come forward um, that may not be as desirable um, and put an application in and get in front of us in the process. But, you know, we're here, we understand that we're requesting uh, a project of a scale that's larger um, than the total need, frankly, in the, in, in the town right now to get over your cap. Um, we certainly don't have the ability to, to cut the project in half and move it forward. So as we've discussed early on, um, we have cut the project down significantly and we've, we've really worked hard to fit it in within the parameters which are challenging of this site. Um, but, you know, so we, we would love to see this move forward um, sooner than later. But again, I don't wanna scare folks with that because that's really just step one, Mr. Chairman, in a process that will allow public comment, um, will allow comment through the zoning board appeals process. So it's really, you know, it's really, um, the beginning, not the end. Um, okay. Did you did you have some more slides you wanted to present? Um, we just have the ones. I know we're running short on time. On the, the case studies of a couple of projects we've built recently, I showed these last time. This is in Stone of Mass. Uh, we're currently in lease up. Lease up is going fantastic on this property and has been throughout the pandemic. One of the um, you know bright spots in the portfolio. Frankly, this is a two hundred and sixty one unit. Uh, four and five story projects, so certainly larger in scale than what we're proposing here, but surface parked with uh, freestanding garages uh, as we're proposing here as well. And we're about 70% leased up, 74%, I think, as of this week on this property, uh, which is located right near um, the Fells in Stoneham, if people know where that is. Then here's a couple more shots of the interior and the courtyard of that property. Um, very, very high end. If you take a look at the kitchen in the bottom left picture, we've got um, wood shaker cabinets, quartz countertops. Um, those are luxury vinyl plank floors, um, slide in electric range, stainless steel appliances, like really high end stuff. And uh, that's what we would intend to build here as well. 
And then another case study, one we did a few years back, um, a little bit smaller in scale, but, but taller in height, 157 units in Walpole. Um, this was a 40B project as well, but this was a four-story surface park with uh, freestanding garages. Um, this is one that was completed back in 2018. Um, you can see uh, the courtyard with the pool in it, and a couple of these pictures are, are pretty loud and uh, robust amenity area with the orange red, um, which was kind of a magnet for people, but uh, ended, up, ended up being a, a crowd favorite. This, this project did very, very well for us a few years back. These are some more pictures. Again, the courtyard in the top left, a picture of the uh, amenity space in the top right, and then a couple of uh, photos of the interior of the units. Uh, very similar to Stoneham on the, the right-hand side there with the slide-in range, glass tile backsplash, stainless steel appliances, quartz countertops, and uh, luxury vinyl plank flooring. We're very proud of that. And that was, that was what I had. Um, I know that's a lot of information and I appreciate you hearing me out. I'd, I'd be more than happy to answer questions or flip back through any of these um, slides if, if folks would like to do that. Uh, any questions or comments from the Board of Selectmen? I'm, I'm good right now. I, I like the improvements that are made to the, uh, the site and uh, the redesign. I, I think it's definitely in the right direction. Thank you. Um, as I was listening to the presentation, I had I had one question that um, we haven't brought up before, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm going to um, show my ignorance of, of these kinds of projects by asking mm -hmm. this question. But you've got uh, a high density um, residential units with multiple floors, and so not everyone's going to have a ground floor entry directly into their unit. Uh, talk to me a little bit about security and how that's, and what role the town's police force will play in that. Sure, yeah. And so there, there's a couple of different building types here, as you can see, right? So buildings one and two with the U-shaped buildings will have corridors. So while they will not have direct entry into each unit, there'll be a, a couple of different ways you can get in and out of the building, which are fobbed. I think that's important. So each, each resident will have a key fob, right? So that key fob will be programmed so that only they can use it to get into the building at lobby. And then they'll have a key fob, whether it's the same one or, or a different one to get into their unit specifically as well. So those buildings, will, you'll come into a lobby You'll walk down a hallway and you'll go, you'll find your unit or you'll go up the stairs down the hallway and find your unit. In buildings three and four, um, those are non-corridor buildings, a little bit different uh, types. So you'll walk in, they have basically you walk up, if you were on the second floor, you'd walk up into a very small lobby, up the stairway into a landing where you'd have units, um, you know, three or four, or probably about four units to a landing with their entry doors there. And again, the key fob, very importantly, um, for folks who only live there and that are programmed to do so. We have the ability now with management to program everybody's key fob that gives them access to their building, um, to the amenity building only at certain times, only components of the amenity building, and we can track all that as well. Um, in terms of, and then, you know, we have 24 hour management as well. The staff will be there. Uh, business hours, but there'll be 24 hour contact um, for the management staff, of course. And, um, you know, the, the approach of having units on the ground floor is very, very similar to what we do and what, um, what our like kind competitors do across the, you know, the state. Um, very commonplace. Uh, we have not experienced any uh, significant issues with that whatsoever. Um, and uh, it's an approach that's tried and true, and it, it, we don't foresee, certainly in this uh, location, there being uh, many issues. Okay, thank you. I have some comments. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the issues, and maybe Jeff O'Neill can kind of clue you in on this, is uh, there's, there's an access road that connects this site to the school, mm -hmm. as well as to the community garden. So I just want to make sure that gets on the plan and that stays open for public use. 
Um, that's that's over by unit three. Correct. There's presently a, uh, a a car path that goes to that access in the back, but the way that uh, Wood Partners has it laid out now, um, Jonathan, it seems that it has easy, simple access to continue back there. They just stop the impervious where they did on the plan showing that. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that gets shown and it's memorialized because um, that's an important access for garden use. And also there's a lacrosse, I think it's the lacrosse field uh, back there mm -hmm. um, as well as, as, as the cart path to the school. Um, I, I do want to say I'm really disappointed uh, that you cut all the trees and shrubs around the wetland um, that's shown. Um, so that's within the 25 foot buffer. You clear cut that. Um, this is a wetland with uh, an active beaver dam and a beaver den. Um, so that just concerns me. Um, kind of going, think, that's, that doesn't seem, that seems like a rookie move to me. Um, um, I just if I, like to hear what happened. If I can speak to that, that had nothing to do with Wood Partners. So in the back on the lower corner where Jim has his well that's outlined in that corner there, there is a detention basin. There are two outfall pipes and two outfall flows at that detention basin that have to be maintained and repaired on occasion and if any wall blows out. So that is an actual drainage detention basin that is designed to service the parking lot and part of that second building that's in that location. So actual flow goes in there. And if you looked at the history of the order of conditions that have been issued for the property over several years, and even when Flatley developed the property, those are supposed to be maintained and repaired. And so when we can get access to it, we have to go back, we have to clear an area to get equipment back there to do the proper repair. So we're working with a conservation commission now to work on an o and plan to make sure that we're all in concert and working in harmony to make sure everyone has eyes and ears of what's going on down there. Okay, well, it's okay. reassuring to hear that you're, you're doing this in, you know, through the Conservation Commission. Right. Thank you. Right, you wanna make sure it's done right. Right. And then um, I think it's really important that we have strong pedestrian connections. And I brought this up last time so we have the potential of all of these residents. Um, I'd like to see them uh, using local businesses like the bank, Clinton Savings Bank and the veterinary next door, as well as across the street at uh, Bolton Corners. Um, so I just would like to see some thinking about uh, pedestrian uh, sidewalks uh, that get you from this development out to the street, um, sidewalks on the frontage, and maybe a crosswalk uh, over to Bolton Corners. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great comments. We'll we'll take a closer look at that certainly. But you know, on the positive side, I'm glad to see you're proposing three stories. I'm glad to see that you're cons uh, you're cons you're looking into high efficient efficiency appliances, heating and hot water, and you're considering solar. I think that would you know that's those are real positives. So thank you for that. Of course, uh, Don. Uh, what's what precedent is there or is there one for uh, public comment on a project such as this, a 40B? Uh, well, if there's any precedent, it's not recent, and um, there will certainly will be many opportunities for public comment, both at future selectmen meetings, ZBA, uh, planning, conservation. So um, since we're, we're at the conceptual level here, but or a little more than conceptual, but no, there'll be plenty of opportunities going forward. Really, tonight was just meant to be an update for... Um, for wood to present to the board. It's kind of morphed into a lot more than that, but we've already gone beyond what we were uh, planning on doing tonight. So uh, I do think there'll be many opportunities. Do, do we need more information before we enter into an agreement with them to submit 
a lip? Um, I think that's an unfair question to ask the board tonight, quite honestly. Uh, again, that wasn't the intent of tonight's meeting, at least it wasn't the stated intent. I, I would advise the board um, that you would take until the next meeting to absorb what you've heard tonight, probably come up with some questions of your own uh, once you've thought it through. Um, and then um, I can talk with Jim offline, Valerie and I can, and um, sort of put together uh, between what you come up with and what we come up with uh, to get your comfort level and maybe the next meeting you could uh, you could vote on something like that but I don't think it's reasonable to expect you to agree to that tonight okay so in this case Unless the board disagrees if the, if the board has no questions and you're comfortable then that's fine but I just I think that puts you in a difficult position to do yeah, that tonight. I wasn't ready to jump in tonight okay I thought you might be um Jonathan or Stan yeah, I'm comfortable um, what's being presented. I'm I, if you guys want to wait, that's fine. But I'm I'm more than happy to move forward with this process. Yeah, I'd I'd like to wait. So what I would what I would propose then is that we do something similar to what we suggested before. We make this these these documents presented tonight public. We invite public comment at the April fifteenth meeting if if Jim and uh, Jim Lambert and others can attend. Uh, to collect the comments. We wouldn't be looking for anything new at that time unless you in your conversations with Don Lowe um, find it beneficial to do that. And I would, uh, I would at least target the 15th to, as, as a day to make some kind of commitment. I think that's fair. That's great and we're amenable to that certainly. Thank okay. you. Jonathan and Stan, you okay with that? That's yep. fine. That sounds good. All right. Um, let that be the plan then. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Thank you Jim. Appreciate sure. it. Take care. Uh, next up are um, issues unresolved uh, annual town meeting warrant articles. Uh, the uh, advisory committee is joining us for this part of the um, um, Selectmen's meeting tonight. They will be voting on some articles, as will the selectmen. Uh, Don, would you want to walk us through what the uh, process will be for this section of the meeting? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, advi advisory was waiting to vote um, until they heard, uh, uh, as far as the planning articles go, they were waiting to vote on uh, the outcome of last night's planning board meeting. Um, I don't know, it, it, it probably makes sense just to go sequentially here. So, and maybe the two boards could, could vote one after another on the respective articles, but um, on article three, the selectmen at least, and I don't know if advisory has already voted, but the selectmen at least need to vote uh, the recommendations on article three. Are there any comments or questions about article three? Nope. Someone like to make a motion? Make a motion. We recommend approval of Article 3. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Jenny, roll call. Sorry, I had to stop the screen share to find my mute button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. Does advisory need to vote? No, um, I think actually there's only one article that we haven't voted on, which was the planning board article related to the um, accessory apartments. Oh, so that would be article 11. And okay. I just want to add, I, I did try to see, I, I couldn't watch last night what the planning board's discussion is. So if anyone here <laughs> knows what the outcome of that discussion was, because the video is not available yet. I'm assuming that they were fine with the changes that council had recommended. Um, they uh, removed the reference to the, uh, the condominiums and kept the square footage the way it was. So it, it, it remains a two thirds vote. They, they didn't reduce the area, which was an option. It wasn't a requirement. 
Okay. Uh, next, I think, is Article 5. Article 5. Don, you the, said there was some change in language there? There was a change. There was a subtle change in language, so you may wish to revote it. Um, to, to clarify the intent, uh, this first phrase in Article 5 now reads, to see if the town will vote to authorize the town administrator to be a required second signatory along with the fire chief for any expenditures from the ALS revolving fund in excess of $25,000. It's a slight rewording to make sure that it's clear that any expenditure in excess of $25,000 would require approval. Um, council thought it might be a little muddy. So it's the same intent, just a little bit clearer language. Do the selectmen want to vote again or are we okay? I'm fine with it. I'm fine I'm with fine. it. I'm fine. Okay. Okay, continuing in order then, we would move on to Article 11, which is the uh, accessory apartment article. Okay, now does, does this version incorporate any changes made last night? Yes, it, it's the final wording. Okay. So what, Don, what was the upshot about um, an accessory apartment becoming a permanent, uh, it, it, its own dwelling? They removed any reference to the condominium wording that was in there. And so the, the question was, is I guess last time, does that leave us vulnerable to that? I, What's I our protection? Believe, I don't believe it does because part of the requirement is still for any of these accessory apartments, um, you need a you need a uh, a certificate of occupancy and review by the building inspector. So mm -hmm. I don't believe that we would be in a position where it could become a, a standalone dwelling. Okay. Is there a motion on, on Article 11? Make a motion we recommend to approve. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Roll call. Roll call by Saki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. Um, is it okay if I make a motion for advisory? Please. All right, so I'll make the motion that we approve Article 11. This is Omid, I second that. Okay, um, roll call, Bill. Aye. Bob. Aye. Ann. Ann, you might be muted. Just disappeared. Okay, Craig. how's that? There we go, Ann. Okay, aye. Craig. Craig. Aye. And I'm a yes as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other changes to the uh, warrant, Don? Uh, and if I might. Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, go back to Article 10. Um, as you know, I'm full support of, of the, the intent of the article, but because we have chosen or the majority of the board has chosen to go the route that would cost the town money, I was necessarily opposed to it. I did speak to the town clerk uh, the other day because in, in an earlier meeting, uh, it was discussed that this co the cost to change from board of selectmen to select board would be in the order of four to six thousand dollars, and considering during the budgeting process we're asking departments to cut a hundred dollars out of this and that line item, I was opposed to that given that we had a um, another route to go that would not cost the town any money and not incur any any time and overhead by our town clerk. I have since found out that the cost is less, although the cost is between fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars. Just to have uh, unanimous support, I would like to uh, 
have us revote that. I would like to change my vote from opposed to uh, affirmative in terms of recommending this article. So would you be making a motion to uh, reconsider? Yes, reconsider the vote, yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of reconsidering, please say aye. 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 Roll call, aye. Waisaki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any further uh, discussion on Article 10? Uh, sorry, no. Um, there being none, uh, all those in favor of uh, recommending approval of Article, uh, do I have a motion to recommend approval of Article 10? I make a motion we recommend approval of Article 10. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call. Roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Don? Uh, now, one last article, Mr. Chairman. It's already been voted, um, but just to clarify for you, the board, Article 19, um, the 19,000 gross vehicle weight dump truck for $115,000 is still a borrowing article, but it's being paid for within two and a half. It doesn't require a debt exclusion override, so it is no longer a ballot question. Uh, as it was, I believe, the last time this, the, uh, the uh, board saw the warrant. So nothing has changed other than we removed the prop two and a half override language, and um, and it'll be uh, the borrowing will be paid for as part of the budget. Uh, so so this will this will this will not be exempt from two and a half. No, it will not. Okay. Um, Which is a good thing. We're avoiding. Uh, we're, we're, Managing within our, our budget. Yeah. So do we still need a two thirds majority? Yes, because it's still a borrowing. It's just a borrowing. Okay. Just make sure. Okay. Do you need a vote because of, of what was deleted? I don't believe so. I mean, the, it, unless the board wants the, the the intent is the same. It's really just a mechanism. I'm fine leaving it the way. We, we we all said yes before. I'm sure we'll all say yes again. Right. Yeah. But I I just want to give. Yeah. I'm fine with it too. I just want to give everybody the opportunity. Okay. But I just wanted to make sure there were no surprises and, and because there, there were two ballot questions and now there's one for the fire truck. Okay. That's always a good thing. Okay. I, aside from that, I believe we have covered everything. Unless I've forgotten something. I, I've made plenty of notes before the meeting, so I, I can always miss something, but I don't think I did. Does advisory have any outstanding questions or comments about the uh, budget? No, we are all set. Thank you all for your help. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone on advisory. I think you did a great job this year. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. We'll drop off now. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Hey. Um, next we need, uh, no, we need a motion. Stop. Sign yeah, I'll make a motion that we vote to sign and execute the uh, uh, 2020 ATM uh, warrant. Second. 2021 ATM warrant. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call, Waisaki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. Uh, may I remind everybody that before this goes to the printer, which it needs to do soon, it does need all three signatures. Yes, please. So if the board could come in over the weekend, Friday or over the weekend, uh, Jenny will have it out on the, on the counter for you. Yep, it's already out on the counter and I have a black and a blue pen for your preference for signing. <laughs> all right. It's always nice to have <laughs> options. And all right. Well, what would, you, what would you like, Jenny? Do you, would you like black or blue? Well, as long as one of you does blue, I do think it makes the original stand out. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank um, Jenny and Don and advisory and all the other uh, departments for uh, helping us finish another annual town meeting warrant, planning board included. It's a lot of work. Yep. Um, it's, it's a good document. It's going to be a good town meeting. 
Yeah, yeah. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Here's the town administrator report. Yeah. Denny and I are still speaking to one another too, which is a good thing. <laughs> and, and only one slammed door. And only only one, one of you is, only only one of you is smiling when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, the COVID update. I, I just want to report that uh, Bolton remains green. So that's a positive thing where uh, I think we'll be gray soon, but um, uh, we had a bit of an uptick, so we remain green. and. Um, statewide, the, the rolling seven-day positivity rate is at 2.02%. That's crept up a little bit over the past few weeks. We were down as low as, I think, 1.6, 1.67. Um, so, and some other things seem to be plateauing. So I'm, this personally makes me a little nervous that we're not seeing a continuing downward trend. But on, on the upside, more and more people are getting vaccinated. So that's a good thing. Um, the other thing that we had for tonight is the town administrator's uh, performance against the before, FY21 before go goals. There, excuse me Sorry. for interrupting. Um, um, there was some vaccination done this week by the town. Is that Chief Legendre's? Yes, Chief Legendre uh, worked with... Um, worked with the federal agency, I believe, and uh, almost exclusively, well, it's never just one person, but uh, by far and away, if it wasn't for Chief Legendre, uh, we would not have had that vaccination clinic last Saturday. It was at the Neshoba Regional High School. There were 100 doses given. Um, the vast majority went to teachers, which was the intent. Uh, you know, with the with the governor and the president president wanting teachers back in school as soon as possible, Chief Legendre wanted to help with that. So um, yeah. uh, he worked very closely with the superintendent, and um, lists were coordinated. So uh, anyone who expressed uh, a desire uh, who worked uh, for the school department to get a vaccination got a vaccination. And as well, uh, so uh, did the uh, uh, DPW workers, town hall workers, and uh, library workers who requested a shot. So um, he, he did that in an extremely efficient manner. I think he's going to be able to do a future one, um, hopefully for town residents. Um, he was. Uh, he was hoping to get more vaccine than he did, but he certainly uh, he certainly used everything he had, and uh, would would not have happened without his efforts. And he's to be congratulated. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, next, uh, the performance against my FY twenty one goals. As I looked at this, I thought to myself, "What in the world was I thinking when I agreed to seven goals?" But that being said. Um, I think it went, um, uh, I think we had another good year. I believe, um, I accomplished everything that, um, I set out to do, uh, and perhaps a wee bit more, but, um, uh, I, I sent the document out to the board a couple of weeks ago with my, uh, with my, uh, position as far as how I feel I performed against it. And, I, and, and I'm happy to, uh, walk through it. Uh, and please stop me at any time if you want me to say more. But uh, first of all, oversee the successful conversion to uh, LED streetlights. Um, I, I worked with National Grid to, to achieve 100% conversion of all streetlights at no expense to the town. Uh, we had a few constituent concerns that were expressed, and we ultimately got those worked out through my, uh, through my uh, liaison at National Grid. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don, for that. Thank you. Uh, um, secondly, uh, exploring the possibility of installing an, an electric car charging station in town. We're actually to the point now where we have the possibility of two, one at uh, the public safety building and one at uh, the DPW. Those proposals are in the hands of the state right now. And um, it's still my hope and expectation that between uh, the DEP, 
uh, grants that are available and uh, national grid program that will be able to implement this uh, successfully uh, at no expense to the town. If there is any expense, I think it'll be minimal, but I'm, right now I'm planning on no expense to the town. So very excited about that. Um, continue to successfully manage the capital planning process, including a three-year plan with funding sources. Um, I did, I believe, successfully complete the capital review process. I made my recommendations to advisory who accepted them. Um, I have established a five-year plan uh which uh right now addresses the school district and the fire department with a new dpw director coming on board i didn't feel it was fair to him to try to get him to create a five-year plan in the short period of time he had but we are purchasing um asset management software and we believe by utilizing that software it'll be a great tool for him to put together a very sound five-year plan for next year, starting in FY23. And um, that'll also be made available to the police department uh, to help manage the fleet and uh, see if we have any opportunities there or anything. So um, I do believe that um, we were able to get the, get, get the capital projects budgeted that we needed to get budgeted. Um, Actually, there was one project I was going to defer, and once the budget fell into place, it seemed to me that um, we should get it done while we can because we don't know what next year holds for us right now. Um, so the uh, the oil tank removal is one that I was going to hold off on, but I ended up recommending that we spend the thirty thousand dollars on that this year, and um, and that is an article as you know in the town meeting warrant. So again. Um, Working with Brian Boyle, um, we, we, we talk a lot, we exchange a lot of email, and um, I, I felt like, and I think Brian would agree, that the capital planning process went, went quite well again this year. Um, continue to work with advisory on the, on, uh, to assist in the budget process overall. Certainly did that. Uh, Brian and I uh, spoke many, many times. Um, if either one of us had a thought, we just picked up the phone and called each other. Um, my, uh, I attended many of the advisory meetings. Um, and again, I, I, I think this is a good budget. You know, I, I think for, with, the, with the year that we've gone through, um, we have been able to keep the town afloat and address uh, what's, what's necessary. And um, we ended up in a much better place than I thought we would nine months ago. I was extremely nervous nine months ago and somehow we made it all work. Um, create and manage any necessary modifications to current processes relative to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that is an ongoing process to this very day. Uh, I never in a million years would have thought uh, when, when we laid these goals out last year, what was gonna be really waiting for us as far as COVID-19 goes. But uh, with the cooperation of the staff, with the cooperation of our residents, um, we have been able to, in many area towns, I mean, we were, we were wide open for business from July 6th to the Thursday before Thanksgiving. And on both ends of that, uh, still open by appointment only. You know, the only time we were shuttered was from the middle of March to early June. And um, that took a lot of work on the part of a lot of people and a lot of policies and a lot of, uh, a lot of planning, but, but we got there. And it, it, it's actually a source of pride for me that we can sit here tonight looking like we're starting to get near the end of this. And uh, we've been able to, I, I think, operate very, very smoothly. And again, the, the employees all rose to the occasion. And it, and um, I'm very I'm very proud of them. Um, pursue feasibility of the installation of a solar array on town town owned land. Uh, we evaluated um, the cap landfill that did not work out um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, and I, I'm still not fluent in all the terminology, but um, for the uh, sector or whatever you want to call it uh, of the grid that the landfill sits in 
National Grid has no more capacity to take anymore. They're not interested in taking anymore right now. Um, we had an issue with getting three-phase power out there, sufficient three-phase power, which also was a concern. But I think the big one was National Grid just doesn't isn't taking on anymore uh, from uh, from something in that location. The good news is that for reasons I can't explain, our leach field over at the school is in a different sector, and it would be possible to take um, solar from there. And I'm working with our consultant, again, at no cost to us, um, to see about positioning a, leech, uh, a solar array on the leach field. And we're having another meeting next week to, um, I think, get to the point where we can figure out if it's a go or, or a no-go as far as an option goes. Uh, when first we discussed it, I asked uh, the engineers if they had ever done a solar array on a leach field and they said they had done one right next to a leach field and I said that's kind of living right outside the prison it's really not the same thing and um, they had to agree with that so now they believe it is doable um, it, it's looking good it's looking good so I'm hoping in the next meeting or two I may have some favorable news to report on that so uh, so the so the goal was to pursue the feasibility, and I've certainly done that now in the, now in a second location, and I think we've got some upside. And uh, continue to support the master plan committee. I've had several meetings with Bob Romer, Penny Gerken, Brian Boyle, um, uh, Stasha Downing, and um, oh my, when I start naming names, I forget one, and I'm about to forget one. Um, and I'll get in trouble for that. But and one other person to be determined. Um, and uh, the master planning uh, committee is moving along very well. Uh, as you know, they did get that uh, grant uh, from the regional planning agency for some professional <coughs> support. Uh, also, uh, we've made files available in, in town, in town hall to um, the members of the master planning committee that. Uh, uh, that need access to them. Um, access has been limited, but um, um, we'll be doing we'll be doing more of that again as things start to loosen up a little bit more. Um, but master planning seems to be going very well, and I um, have, have spent many hours working with some of these folks. Um, so in short, that's where I am against my goals. I personally feel good about what I've been able to accomplish, but I would be happy to answer any and all questions that any of you have. I'm fine for now. No, no, Don, you've done it. Uh, once again, you've done a great job for the town and uh, we greatly appreciate it. it. It's an impressive list, Don. Thank you for reviewing it with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Don. And unless the board has anything else, I think I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead and stop there. <laughs> okay. I would like to see you back in a, a suit and tie once in a while. Well, let me let me just say that um, when we had our first Zoom meeting, I'm not going to name names, but when we had our first Zoom meeting, I wore a jacket and tie, and it was pointed out to me that I was that I I, would, I, I may be overdressed for the occasion. So I've been uh, I've been holding back, but I can break out my wardrobe at any time. I think no, I'm, well, I'm joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Keep it casual. I like being casual, actually, but uh, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I would just, uh, again, I would just uh, say I think we've had a good year and we've got, uh, I'm looking forward to next year and, uh, and coming up with a new list of goals with you that hopefully doesn't add up to seven this time, but. Uh, Whatever needs to get done, we'll, we'll get it done. Okay. Don, just on, on a related subject there, has the state or anybody provided any guidance or have they said when they are going <laughs> to present guidance for things like when town halls can open for regular business? There has been no guidance on that. Um, I think it's really each town is being left to kind of fend for themselves. I mean, I've got my thoughts as to what I think would be reasonable. Um, I already sent out um, 
an agenda for my April staff meeting where I want to discuss it with the staff and get their feedback. Um, I've got a I've got two different dates in mind, and I think I know which one I'm going to recommend. But um, I want to hear from the staff and and okay. see what their comfort level is. Okay, thank you. Next up is Board of Selectmen business. Are there any public service announcements? No, not this time. I don't. Okay, um, there we need to have a uh, discussion and a possible vote on our intention to lay out Houghton Farm Lane as a public way. So this is the first step in a, in a two-step process. Uh, all you need to do tonight is to actually vote on that with that wording. Um, at your next meeting, you will actually vote the layout. Tonight you're declaring your intent to vote the layout. Well, okay, I'll make a motion that we vote to intent our intention to uh, lay out Houghton Farms Lane as a public way. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, approved bills and payroll warrants W21-19 and W21-19 <coughs> W21-20 and uh, W21-21A. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. Jenny, are there any regular minutes, minutes of regular sessions for us to approve? There is, there's one set. Give me one moment and I'll share them. Okay. I have a motion. Motion to approve the minutes of March 11th, 2021. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. And nobody told me I was muted while I went through the changes. <laughs> that was fine. <laughs> It was great visuals. <laughs> uh, next, the board will enter into executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 39, Section 23B, Purpose 3, Purpose 3 to review and approve minutes of the executive sessions. The board will return to open session solely for the purpose of adjournment. Is there a motion to enter executive session? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call, Wysocki. Aye. Keep. Aye. Sikansky. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> and the board will not be coming out into open session again, is that correct? So we will be coming out just for the purpose of adjournment. Okay. <laughs> 